Thank you, Dr. Goizal, Dr. Dolna, Father Uri, colleagues in the faculty, staff, and especially you students. Before I begin, I just want to thank Pater Pio for his excellent homily. Um, please God, we may live it. And there are several similarities between what he has to say and what I have to say. However, mine is definitely the impoverished rendition. Now, I would like to take um, this opportunity at the beginning of the semester to remind us what we're doing, why we're doing it, by looking at the good that we're all seeking here. So that's the purpose of this talk. Now, my lecture is divided into two parts. We'll be looking at the Gospel of John and seeing how it illuminates two aspects of the Catholic liberal tradition, namely the, the current crisis of Western education and then the good that Catholic liberal education seeks. So first, the crisis of Western education. At the very core of Jesus' teaching in the Gospel of John is a fundamental theological truth that all things are from the Father. Now, although Jesus is the great I am, the one who comes from the Father, he too has his origin in the Father as one who is begotten by him and comes from him. Jesus says, the son can do nothing of his own, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever he does, the son does likewise. Because of this, Jesus actually is the truth in his person, as he tells us, I am the way and the truth and the life. Now, in sharp contradistinction to this foundational theological truth, the Gospel of John also clearly teaches about a fundamental falsehood. In chapter 12, John reports that although Jesus performed many miraculous signs before his people, they did not believe in him because, quote, they loved the glory of men more than the glory of God. Now, Jesus reprimands them for, quote, not seeking the glory that comes from the one who alone is God. Fixation with the glory of men darkens the mind to the truth and leads to falsehood. Take, for instance, the declaration of the chief priests a Pilate, which is utterly astonishing in light of salvation history. We have no king but Caesar. Or equally outrageous statement by the Jews, Quote, we have never been slaves to anyone. I guess they forgot about the 400 years in Egypt. Now, loving the glory of man more than the glory of God and their subsequent falsehood is a sign of their paternal origin. For as Jesus says, quote, you do what you have heard from your father, the devil. End quote. For the devil, Jesus tells us, Quote, does not stand in the truth because the truth is not in him, end quote. Jesus underlines one significant reason why there is no truth in him. Because, quote, when he lies, he speaks out of his own. The fact that the ruler of this world speaks out of his own signifies that he does not align himself to the fundamental theological truth so powerfully revealed in the Gospel of John, that all things, even the Son of God, are out of the Father as their principle. Instead, the devil stands alone, considering himself to be the measure of all things and the source of his life and power, and subsequently appropriates all things to himself. He too, like man, prefers his own glory over and above the glory of God. As Jesus says, he who speaks on his own seeks his own glory. However, Jesus is clear where such preferences lead. They lead to slavery. For the devil's obsession with his own is the root of his sin, of his falsehood, his lies, his murders. And Jesus teaches that everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. These theological truths of the, from the Gospel of John 
shed much light on the current crisis of Western education in two significant ways. First, for most contemporary Western academic institutions, the principle which justifies their pursuits is, to use Johannine terms, the glory of man. Today, man is considered to be the measure of all things and an end in himself. And therefore, it is not surprising that he is the ordering principle of all academic pursuits. Randomly review any educational organization and you'll see that things of man dominate it. What he thinks, how he acts, what he produces all take center stage. Human wisdom and power are its pillars. This is clearly made manifest in several concrete ways. First, it is expressed in its curriculum where the study of humanities has a preeminent position. At the core of this discipline is again what is man-made. It includes the history of philosophers and their ideas, not the search for wisdom itself. It's the study, it includes the study of different human societies, of the history of mankind, of his inner psychological life, and of his literary masterpieces. Here, theology is replaced by religious studies, which, which religion is something that man himself possesses. Its investigation into nature through the empirical science is primarily pursued in reference to man for the sake of furthering his technological domination of it. Here, learning usually consists of mainly, mainly of encyclopedic memorization. Secondly, a further expression of its origin from man is the widespread elective system where students themselves are the arbiters of the best manner of their intellectual development over and above any curricular traditions. Here, the interests of the students and their so-called academic freedom reign supreme. A third manifestation of the humanistic principle of our current Western academic institutions is the highly specialized vocational and professional training that has become the commonplace, giving production and practical progress the upper hand over any transcendent speculative inquiries. What Jesus said about the slavery caused by fixation with one's own is analogous to the crisis of Western education in a second way. The end pursued of most modern approaches to education is primarily directed to one's individual good. Any interest in the truth is a private one. It is ordered primarily to oneself for the sake of one's own advantages. For example, the usual academic goal of most students today is to obtain a specialized degree in a particular profession which they hope will enable them to acquire a job. Once obtained, this knowledge is used as a means to accumulate as much money as possible. Here we have the quintessential academic pursuit, namely to acquire a profession and a job, ordered to the quintessential private good, money. One's own has never received so much glory. This educational system asks the same of its professors. Their main aims, like their students, are private ones. Completion of a doctoral dissertation is a useful tool for obtaining a teaching position. The teacher defines himself not so much from serving in the classroom, but from his endless stream of articles and books, which flow forth, not for the sake of furthering truth, but for the sake of manifesting the novelty of his own position. So to be honored, to, to be honorably accepted in peer review circles and societies. The praise and prestige gained from other men in turn, is ordered to promotion and tenured job security. As in the case with the students, the principal end is man and the glory of his private good. The effects of fixation on one's own in education are devastating. What develops is an academic climate that where there is a reduction in a shared life between students and professors due to the constraints 
of overt specialization. Moreover, there is an increase in competition among individuals and subsequent contempt for others due to a, pre due to a preoccupation for personal success. This leads to division between me and them, between students, between professors, between professors and students. In short, this climate is too harsh for any intellectual life to thrive. Instead, strife, enmity, falsehood are rulers of the cutthroat Western academic world. In his Life of Alexander, Plutarch records a letter which Alexander the Great wrote to his teacher Aristotle, who taught him, among other things, metaphysics. What Aristotle writes is a poignant, I'm sorry, what Alexander writes is a poignant example of placing the pursuit of individual interests in academic endeavors above and beyond any other end, and the consequent contempt of others that follows upon it. Here writes Plutarch, when he, Alexander, was in Asia and heard Aristotle had published some treatises of metaphysics, he wrote to him using very plain language in behalf of philosophy, the following letter. Alexander to Aristotle, greeting. You have not done well to publish your books of oral doctrine. For what, is there, for what is there now that we excel others in? If those things which we have been particularly instructed be laid open to all. For my part, I assure you, I had rather excel others in the knowledge of what is excellent than in the extent and power of my dominion. Farewell. Because Alexander the Great loved his preeminence more than the common good of metaphysical truth, it is doubtful that he made any serious progress in metaphysics. For when such a genuine common good is loved solely as a private good, the latter displaces the former. This displacement is powerfully expressed by St. Augustine. They love their view, not because it is true, but because it is theirs. Otherwise, they could equally love another true view, as I love what they say when what they say is true, not because it is theirs, but because it is true, and therefore not theirs, but true. And if they love a view because it is true, it is already both theirs and mine since it belongs in common to all lovers of the truth. And therefore, O Lord, your judgments should be feared, because your truth is neither mine, nor is, his anyone's, nor is it anyone else's, but it belongs to all of us who are publicly called to its communion, warning us terribly not to have it in private, so as not to be deprived of it. And we could think of the Pharisees here. For anyone who claims as proper to himself what you have given to all to enjoy and wants to be his own what belongs to all is driven away from what is common to his own. That is, from the truth to the lie. Now listen to this. For the one who speaks, the lie speaks out of his own. So St. Augustine must be referring to the Gospel of John there, even though he doesn't reference it directly. It is clear then that the educational system that originates and culminates out of that which is man's own is a misdirected and disorienting system that does not stand in the fullness of the, of the transcendent truth. Although hopefully falsehood is not the explicit intended end of any given contemporary academic institution, most today can only offer to its students a fragmented and impoverished participation in the truth. According to the Gospel of John, this results in a reduced freedom and compromised personal fulfillment. Such education will, paradoxically, be less human, possessing, not unlike the devil, 
a resemblance of slavery. Part two, the good of Catholic liberal education. Before he made his remarks about the devil's falsehood in speaking out of his own and its consequent slavery, Jesus spoke to the Jews who had believed in him, saying, If you b abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We can glean four things from this text that illuminate the good pursued in Catholic liberal education. First, Jesus' disciples must orient themselves towards his word and the truth. The reason for this ordering is that Jesus' word is a transcendent one that has its origin not in man, but in God. Jesus says, I do nothing of my own, but I speak these things as the Father has taught me. Moreover, Jesus' word is for all of us in a universal manner. Because of its eminent communicability, it is a good that can be simultaneously shared by all people at the same time without ever being split or lessened. Since his word is a good that is greater than I, if a man be true and honest, he ought to order himself primarily to it rather than appropriating it to himself. For almost two millennia, the double tradition upon which Western education is founded, namely the Greco-Roman, liberal art, and Christian traditions, sought truths greater than themselves, which are in themselves worthwhile and desirable. In heeding Jesus' command, Catholic liberal education subordinates the entire academic community, students, professors, administrators, and all of its actions to the pursuit of the common good of truth, rather than to the consumer appropriation of things to one's own. Such an ordering gives this education shape and definition, as well as clarity regarding its goal. For instance, the ordering of an objective good that transcends man helps to clarify a hierarchy of knowledge. Servile and practical arts are ordered to speculative and theoretical. More importantly, as reason is ordered to faith, so too all natural realities are ultimately studied for the sake of better understanding supernatural realities and in an order required by the latter. Lastly, such an ordering principle includes a classification of the intellectual tradition of thinkers who are considered masters because of their depth of insight, their clarity of thought, and their saintly lives. Such authors and their respective texts operate as sources from which greater understanding can spring. Jesus' words illuminate the good sought in Catholic liberal education in a second way. Believers are called by Jesus to abide in his word. In a similar manner, Catholic liberal education pursues the good of truth, ultimately Christ himself, through an ethos of abiding. For the truth in itself is an indivisible whole which encompasses all those who seek it. Being exceedingly communicable, it is not limited or reduced to any one of its, its adherents, but rather it gathers into itself all of its devotees and subsequently constitutes a, constitutes a community of its lovers. This common good is, therefore, not alien to one's personal good, but on the contrary, each person personally shares in it because each one is himself a part of this constitutive whole. Therefore, where contemporary education breeds con competition against and contempt for one's fellow learners, this classical double tradition of Western education fosters a shared life united in the truth. Such a common life generates a deep, lasting friendship. Ordering oneself, therefore, to the common good of truth 
has a power to lift one out of the narrow circle of one's private life and to widen our heart for the great whole in which we abide together with others in the peace and joy of this great good. Now, practically speaking, this ethos of abiding subscribed by Catholic liberal education involves taking the necessary pedagogical steps to offer room for discovery and wonder about the truth of reality itself. It includes providing time to read a text closely and inquisitively. It allows for the formation of reflective and critical judgment regarding arguments. Most of all, it fosters the contemplation of truth once it is found. Catholic liberal education recognizes that an ethos of abiding is furthered by sharing in an active discussion with other people who together question the text, argue from principles, and make judgments about conclusions, all for the sake of dwelling together in adoration of the truth. In one of his letters, Plato describes such pedagogical abiding as follows. It is only when all these things, names and definitions, visual and other sensations are rubbed together and subjected to tests in which questions and answers are exchanged in good faith and without malice, that finally, when human capacity is stretched to its limit, a spark of understanding and intelligence flashes out and illuminates the subject at issue. Thirdly, Jesus, address, Jesus addresses his words to believers. Belief stands in the foreground of Jesus' statement, as it does for Catholic liberal education. It is the beginning and end of all its academic pursuits. At the beginning, the governing principle is faith-seeking understanding. All inquiry is informed by Catholic faith. All disciplines are studied and taught within the heart of the church in conformity with the deposit of faith passed on to her. At the end, the point of arrival is a deeper understanding of our Catholic faith, which together with reason aims at the fullness of God as St. Paul teaches, to be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know Christ's love, which surpasses knowledge, in order to be filled up unto the fullness of God. However, coming to knowledge of the truth includes all secondary truths, precisely because in God, as the Gospel of John teaches, all things were made, and without him nothing was made. Because of this fact, faith-seeking understanding does not exclude the truths of the Greco-Roman liberal art tradition, but rather includes and builds upon them, all the while perfecting and ordering them into an organic, unified whole. Such an ordered synthesis between revealed supernatural realities and natural ones have been the successful bulwark of the double tradition of Western education for almost two millennia. The last manner in which the good pursued by Catholic liberal education can be illuminated by Jesus' words in the Gospel of John is that the knowledge of the truth affects a free man. As we have already said, ordering oneself first and foremost to the truth is where man's greatest good lies. Thus, in possessing this genuine good, a person finds fulfillment of his dignity and his life before God as an adopted child. Jesus says, the slave does not abide in the house forever, but the son does. This fulfillment is the end point of human freedom. Jesus' statement, the truth will set you free, is certainly the chief tenet of a Catholic liberal education. As in the gospel, liberal does not mean release from some confinement, but rather, it refers to the ultimate goal which this education provides, namely to generate a generally free person. 
Education is liberal and a person is deemed free when he may come to knowledge and love of goods which are not only higher than himself, but are also intrinsically worthwhile. Here, freedom and perfection of human understanding and affection meet. Therefore, a Catholic liberal education, which ITI seeks to provide for all of us here, has as its ultimate good and goal the perfection of all learners for the sake of generating personal happiness in communion with all those who are sharing in the truth. Such persons are the beneficiaries of Jesus' promise. I came that they may have life and have it in abundance. They are indeed fully alive to the glory of God. Thank you. Thank you.